a big day in the courts when it comes to questions about the Second Amendment. Good morning, Bishop on Air with you here each and every weekday morning. Be sure to follow me anywhere. Just search Bishop on Air. We've been tracking the Illinois gun and magazine ban and gun registry and uh, some movement expected today in the Southern District of Illinois, where Judge Stephen McGlynn is going to be meeting with plaintiff's attorneys to essentially spell out how they're going to go forward in the case challenging the state's gun and magazine ban and registry on the merits. This, as the U.S. Supreme Court is set to hear cases uh, concerning the bump stock ban in the United States. Uh, so we'll uh, tackle uh, those things here and also look at other things going on across the country when it comes to the Second Amendment. Thanks again for being here each and every weekday morning. I'm Greg Bishop. Follow me anywhere. Just search Bishop on air. Uh, so let's start with the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. They're going to be, uh, of course, hearing the Cargill case this morning. Uh, they've also got another case they're dealing with. Uh, concerning uh, the digital currencies, which will be interesting for those who uh, follow that space. Uh, Coinbase, uh, a digital currency exchange, having a case also heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, but you should be able to follow the U.S. Supreme Court just simply by going to the U.S. Supreme Court's website. Uh, and we'll pull that up so you can see how to manage this and, and maybe follow along with the case as it uh, plays out. So just go to supremecourt.gov and scroll down, you'll see uh, you know, quick links, you'll see the calendar where today on the 28th, they do have oral arguments, and then uh, you scroll down and you gotta get to Wednesday, February 28th. And here we are with the uh, Garland Attorney General versus Cargill. And this case, of course, uh, stemming from the question of bump stocks and whether the ATF by rule can go through and uh, ban bump stocks. So uh, Michael Cargill on uh, Twitter uh, highlighting that uh, Texas man challenging bump stocks is going to be heard in front of the uh, U.S. Supreme Court today. Uh, and that's going to be happening at uh, 9 o'clock Central this morning. Uh, but again, go to the U.S. Supreme Court's website and you'll see down there uh, the briefs and more information about the case, uh, the Cargill case, but also a live link there where you can listen to live oral arguments of the case as it plays out today, 9 a.m. Central. Uh, but what are some of the uh, issues that are being brought up here? Well, let's go ahead and, and look at the uh, uh, the docket for the Cargill case on the U.S. Supreme Court's website. Uh, there you'll see that uh, you know they filed uh, a petition for writ uh, on April 6th of 2023. It kind of gives you a bit of an idea of how long it takes for these cases to actually matriculate to get to an oral argument. Uh, before the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, so if you look at uh, the initial petition here, uh, you can get an idea of the questions presented. And uh, it says, since 1986, Congress has prohibited the transfer or possession of any new machine gun. The National Firearms Act defines a machine gun as any weapon which shoots in, is designed to shoot or can be readily restored to shoot automatically before and one more shot without manually reloading by a single function of the trigger. Statutory definition also encompasses any part designed and intended solely and exclusively or combination of parts designed and intended for use in converting a weapon into a machine gun. A bump stocks a device designed and intended to permit users to convert a semi-automatic rifle so that the rifle can be fired continuously with a single pull of the trigger, discharging potentially hundreds of bullets per minute. In 2018, after a mass shooting in Las Vegas carried out using bump stocks, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives, ATF, published an interpretive rule concluding that bump stocks are machine guns as defined by the law. In the decision below, the en banc Fifth Circuit held that the ATF rule was unlawful because the statutory definition of machine gun does not encompass bump stocks. The question presented is as follows, whether a bump stock device is a machine gun as defined in the law because it's designed and intended to use in converting a rifle into a machine gun into a weapon that fires automatically more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. So really that, uh, that seems to be the, the main argument here in as far as what are uh, gonna be happening. And uh, it was the, the Attorney General for the United States that actually petitioned the US Supreme Court to hear this because the Fifth Circuit ruled that uh, the ATF overstepped its bounds. So this case is not just about the idea of a bump stock and what defines a bump stock and does it really convert a semi-automatic firearm into a machine gun 
Uh, these are uh, obviously some questions that uh, are going to be posed during the uh, the hearing today. Uh, but if you look at uh, some of the gun control advocates uh, and what they're saying you should be looking out for, uh, you've got every town on Twitter, X, uh, they, they say that bump stocks effectively convert assault weapons into machine guns. Tomorrow, today, uh, SCOTUS will hear oral arguments in U.S. versus Cargill to decide whether or not the ATF's ban on bump stocks is constitutional. Here's what you need to know, every town says. Bump stocks are so-called conversion devices that uh, increase the rate of fire of semi-automatic AR and AK-style rifles to up to 800 rounds per minute, effectively turning them into machine guns. Effectively every town says uh they were designed to skirt the law and mimic automatic gunfire and then they go through some of the background of that just horrible shooting that happened in las vegas uh where the bump stocks were were used uh also uh they say that uh, you know again more background the atf uh, finalized a rule to prohibit the manufacturing sale and possession of bump stocks uh, and they also uh, just provide even more uh, saying machine guns don't belong in our communities uh, so, again, the, the question of what this case is really going to boil down to, uh, yes, bump stocks are central, but also central to the case is can the ATF make law by rule? Because you had, at the, after this mass shooting, a, a push to uh, prohibit bump stocks, and then President Donald Trump, he didn't necessarily try to go through Congress to do this, to actually pass a law. Instead, he ordered ATF to come up with this rule, but this rule has criminal penalties in it. It said, hey, after you know certain dates, if you don't turn these in or if you don't tell us that you have them, then you could be violating the law and face criminal penalties. So the question is, can the ATF essentially create a rule that is law and possibly have criminal penalties with it? Same question goes to the idea of unserialized firearms or unfinished lower receivers, which are the lower part of, a, say, an AR-15, where it might be 80% finished piece of metal, 80% finished, and then you buy it. And then you can go and finish it to 100% to where it can then be assembled with other parts to create an AR-15. It's an unserialized firearm that you have made. Uh, the political term that's being used for that is ghost guns. So, you know, they essentially, the ATF, uh, in a rulemaking process, said that unfinished lower receivers are essentially firearms. And that challenge also still playing through the courts but this one with bump stocks could address some of those questions about can the atf actually go through and make rules of the sort uh so interesting to see all of that uh with uh with the ongoing case of the atf and uh, bump stock bans uh one other note here from x you've got uh, the question of what every town just posted and you've got rob romano uh he essentially uh you know highlighted that the you have um uh, every town saying bump stocks effectively convert uh, weapons into machine guns. Uh, well, Rob Romano he, he highlights well effectively, so not literally. Uh, so interesting, we'll hear uh, what happens with the U.S. Supreme Court today. Again, go to the U.S. Supreme Court's website uh, and SupremeCourt.gov. All you got to do is just get to the website, scroll down, and then you'll see uh, the the live link for oral arguments. Uh, underneath Wednesday, February 28th. So that's going on at uh, 10 o'clock Eastern, 9 o'clock Central. So be watching that space closely. Uh, but again, in the Southern District of Illinois today, you've got the case where uh, you've got uh, Judge Stephen McGlynn meeting with uh, plaintiff's attorneys to spell out what direction they're looking at going. Uh, and just looking at some of the live chat here, Freedom Steel in the chat uh, sounding off. Uh, Todd Vandermeid, he said, you forgot the FFL brief about the Seventh Circuit. Uh, so maybe we'll let uh, uh, Todd Vandermeid uh, spell that out on his channel. Um, with the, uh, the Seventh Circuit, uh, of course, a different circuit uh, than the uh, Fifth Circuit in the Cargill case. But uh, in the Seventh Circuit here in Illinois, uh, you've got uh, the ongoing filings, uh, even in the U.S. Supreme Court with uh, four challenges asking the U.S. Supreme Court to step in and uh, uh, <laughs> Freedom Steel saying, call me. All right, let's see if we can go ahead and try to bring up uh, Freedom Steel here. I got to uh, do something. Uh, Todd, I'm going to try to call you. All right. <laughs> People in the live chat even said, yeah, call the man. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can uh, pull up uh, Todd to give him a call.
here with uh, Bishop on air. Uh, so I got to uh, make sure I uh, put in and uh, we'll see if this works and give him a call. Uh, you guys will likely hear this come through. Uh, so let's, yep. All right. Let's do it. Calling him. Calling Todd. Hello. Todd. It's Greg. Yeah, I see. I didn't know if you wanted to put me on the, uh, uh, send me the link and put me on because I'm sitting in front of my computer not either way all whatever. right well we're, we're on right now and maybe I can get to, okay. to zoom but either way uh yeah I mean just go ahead Todd Vandermeide with us Freedom Steel on uh YouTube he was in the uh, live chat uh, so definitely want to get his take on some of this so Todd go right ahead uh, spell out uh you know uh, what you expect to happen today with the Cargill case but also uh the FFL's filing in uh the Seventh Circuit oh no it, what, we didn't file in the Seventh Circuit what happened was when they announced they were going to take the Cargill case, I conferred with our attorneys and said, here's the question. How do you talk about bump stocks without talking about semi-autos, particularly AR-15s? And the, I will admit that the Department of Justice did a masterful job in their brief to the court where they danced around the whole subject. And they didn't mention AR-15s. But they talked about the fact that bump stocks make uh, semi-autos, as you've said, they fire like a machine gun. Well, this is about whether or not ATF has overstepped their authority in the way they have redefined what constitutes a machine gun. If you go back to the Seventh Circuit's ruling in the Beavis case when we were at the Court of Appeals, they said AR-15s could be banned because they are just like machine guns. The point we wanted to do was point, that, point out to the court that if you do not do a narrow ruling, then you effectively will have ATF being one regulation away from banning AR-15s and saying they are just like machine guns, just like what the Seventh Circuit, and we use the Seventh Circuit's ruling as the you know the point to said look if you don't give give a narrow ruling then the seventh circuit's logic is what atf can jump to next and all you have to do is look to the vanderstock case out of texas which is the challenge to frame and receivers rule that atf put out because atf has now said that an unfinished piece of metal or plastic is a frame is a firearm They've made this whole new definition. And so we tied the Seventh Circuit's case with the ATF's overreach in the Vanderstock case to sit there and said, you don't have to look very far to see what we're talking about. And it was a way for us to, before we filed our cert petitions, to turn around and get the shenanigans of the Seventh Circuit in front of the Supreme Court and make this argument hoping that, you know, they will say something about Staples, the case that, you know, talked about semi-autos years ago. Hopefully they'll say something else about AR-15s or in common use, just putting the issue in front of the court. And that's why a bunch of us have bingo cards today, and we're all waiting to see what, you know, what comes up in the oral arguments. Do they talk about AR-15s? Do they talk about guns in common use? Well, and do, and do they, they clearly about, define, you know, an AR-15 is indeed a semi-automatic firearm, not an assault weapon or machine gun? Anything like that that the court says in today's oral arguments could be a tipping to, do they say anything about the shenanigans in the lower courts? That's, you know, that was the reason the FFL group with Second Amendment Defense Coalition and Second Amendment Law Center put together the amici brief and we know uh that the cargo lawyers have read it and they were very happy with our take on that you can go to the court's website if you pull up the cargo case on the docket you, you scroll down you will find an amici brief from uh, our groups and you can read you know the the context in which we we're trying to get the issue in front of the court because you can tie it in like i said that if they issue a very broad ruling giving ATF all kinds of discretion, then we're literally one regulation away from finding magazine-fed semi-autos to be declared convertible, and therefore they can be banned just as a bump stock can. So that was the hook to get into it. 
but we're the only guys in the country that I know of that took this approach. Yeah, and, looking... and it's just trying to get, it's trying to get the case, you know, to get more of this information in front of the court. We don't think the court's blind. We don't think they're ignorant of everything that's going on. Well, you know, short before our cert petition, we just wanted to put the issue in front of them. So I don't know if Cargill's counsel will bring any of this stuff up. You know, we're certainly going to be listening to what, you know, the judges have to say and where, where it's going to go. This is another one that is all about, you know, um, regulatory authority. The difference is the government went out of its way not to invoke Chevron. And because if you invoke Chevron, then there's the rule of lenity that should come into play on a ambiguous rule because there's criminal penalties associated with it. And remember, whether it's this one, whether it's Vanderstock with frames and receivers, or if it's the um, uh, the pistol brace rule, I forget which one that is. All of those penalties, you know, they all, all those rules are attached to statutes that have criminal penalties of five to ten years in prison and uh, $250,000 fines. So Chevron should always defer to the rule of lenity that now if it's an ambiguous rule. And hopefully it'll be interesting today because, remember, for you know over a decade, the ATF said these were not, these were not uh, machine guns. They didn't make it a machine gun, just like they said pistol braces were illegal. And then under a hostile anti-gun regime with Joe Biden, they turned around and did a 180. So we'll see what they say about that today. So there's a, it's a hair deeper, but you, you had the right notion when you were giving your analysis of a bunch of it. Right on. Well, and Todd, if I could, while I've got you, uh, we've, of course, got the Southern sure. District with a, uh, a conference today. Uh, plaintiff's attorney is going to be spelling out to the judge uh, what exactly they're uh, they're going to be looking for moving forward. Uh, but we uh, had on Friday, uh, McGlynn, issue that roadmap and uh, some pretty compelling questions that he's uh, going to have the, uh, the the plaintiffs and uh, the defense uh, try to t- answer, including uh, whether these types of firearms that are being uh, challenged here are are meant to help uh, you know defend against tyranny of all things. Right. Well, to first off, it's not just our attorney state. The state will be there as well. This will be an in chambers meeting. It's not open to the public or anything. They are going to try to hammer out um, what's you know what's going to be covered in discovery. Um, I think the state is still playing coy. I think if you go back and read some of the previous filings when the judge wanted to have, if you'll remember, there were some filings, I don't know, what was it, about a month ago when he had that status conference after the, uh, um, after the Ninth Circuit, or Ninth Circuit, after the uh, Seventh Circuit decision was finally uh, reported back down to him. Um, and I think if you read some of those briefs that were filed by the state, the state was demanding our side sit there and tell them each and everything we want to argue, every firearm, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and every point of law or whatever. And then it, so- it sounded like they wanted to sit there and just, you know, Oh, we need time for depositions and all this other stuff. And, you know, I don't think our side sees a lot of need in a, in a ton of depositions for anything because this is largely matter of law. And if we're going to get into fact finding, it's all stuff that you can do written with experts and whatever and put it in front of the judge. And I, I'm hoping that what the judge wrote in his order last week that you know he he sticks to and i i just don't see you know for my what does the state want uh mikhail kalishnikov and eugene stoner are both dead so you can't interview them so what are you really looking for i i read what i read in those briefs that were filed before as the state trying to come up with a um, a, a delaying strategy, and you've heard that McGlynn, you know, whenever everybody said, well, let's see what the Supreme Court says. No, I'm going forward. McGlynn was not interested in delays. 
So if the state tries anything like that, I do not think it's going to be received warmly by the judge. And we'll just have to kind of see what he puts out. I would anticipate some order from him shortly after um, today's meeting that's going to kind of lay out the ground rules on discovery and the time and seeing what there is. Because you know the state's going to ask for an inordinate amount of time for discovery. You know, and then well, they already have, experts. right? I mean, they already have uh, essentially said that they wanted to push the tail end of their discovery into November, which could have set up for either scheduling right around Christmas and so on or right after the new year yeah. in 2025. And that would put us almost two full years uh, into, uh, you know, this this ban uh, being in place uh, while you've got people saying their Second Amendment rights are being violated. Right. And the judge didn't buy any of that. The judge was like, yeah, no. Uh, so I don't think he, the judge indicated before uh, he wanted to be done by 4th of July. He didn't want to screw up, you know, people's summers and stuff. Uh, I think he still wants to hold to that. So the question is, when do we get to trial? And I think once we get to trial, um, you know, it might last a week, depending on how stupid the state wants to get. Uh, you know, they just have a tendency of going over the simple stuff and trying, you know, trying to make the simple stuff, uh, you know, I mean, look, um, things, things, like, dog, things like standing, right? I mean, they keep questioning oh, whether or it, not there's standing in this because, well, nobody's actually come forward and showed that they've been injured by this. Right. You know, which is a ridiculous supposition. We've got gun shops that are going out of business. We've got, you know, we've got all those gun shops, you know, and, and I know what they're going to argue. Oh, you, if you lift the gun ban, then all that pent up buying and frustration no, that's not true because there there are gun shops in Illinois that have internet presences, and for those out of state customers that would buy their products, um, they just go somewhere else because they have the opportunity. So that's lost business that you're not going to recapture, um, amongst other things. And you're right; they're arguing standing. They're arguing. Well, we want to know every single thing that you're going to argue or claim to, and what you know, almost as if that. If, if Greg Bishop is a plaintiff in this case, Greg, but well, I'm going to go out and buy every one of those 170 banned firearms. I want to, because that's what they're trying to get to. Well, then you, you're only looking for an AR-15, so you can't challenge any of this other stuff is the way it almost reads and everything. And, and they're being ridiculous. And to me, if you are arguing about standing and, and like if you saw in my case, they argued at the appellate court standing and then failure to state a claim. And if you are arguing those two points at this juncture, to me, it shows how weak your case is and how lazy you are because you're just trying to stall things out. You don't want to get to what this judge is going to say. And then if you, you know, and we're more than happy to have McGlynn rule on the case, then turn around and go to the Seventh Circuit because what he has set up is a true interesting feat, and I've never seen this in another case. He yells, "You got! I want you to brief Heller and New York, right. and I also want you to brief <laughs> the the Beavis standard." Right. And I, I think what he's doing is he's setting something up so that, uh, hey, Supreme Court, I really wanted to follow your standard, but these numbskulls over here put this ridiculous bullshit out here. It kind of ties my hands. So, you know, um, I, I think that what he gave us is a paint by numbers scheme to sit there and go, okay, um, you know, here's what he's looking for. I mean, now you're not guessing what he's looking for to rule on. The state knows what they may have to prove up, and we know what we have to prove up. And I, I would just simply say that the Seventh Circuit, as I've thought about this over the months, so the Supreme Court came down and said it, it, if it is covered by the text of the Second Amendment, then it is presumptively lawful conduct. The burden shifts to the state. That's the test. And what the Seventh Circuit, in a fit of craftiness and temper tantrum, so they went to the text of the Second Amendment. They just um, 
get past. They didn't even get to keep and bear the right of the people to keep and bear arms. You know, they, they, they went past keep and bear the right of the people. They just went to arms and tried to redefine arms outside of what the court has and then come up with this funky military test. So that's what they did. They went to the text of the Second Amendment. They just skipped over the relevant parts and tried to pluck this obscure um, piece out, um, you know, uh, and that's what they did. So, well, and, and so, now so we're, clearly, we're clearly a, a record is what McGlynn's looking for, a detailed record that will answer any of the questions that the Seventh Circuit's left out there in the open saying, well, you know, while we see the state may be uh, the one that, uh, you know, proceeds as the victor in this case, uh, we still got to get to the merits. So that's what McGlynn's doing. He's getting to the merits, and he's yeah. wanting to answer all of these questions that the Seventh Circuit has ultimately put out there. But not just from the Seventh Circuit. He also, like you said, uh, kind of like parallel. Uh, he wants them to respond to uh, this case uh, and under the, the guise of Heller and Bruin. Right. Right. And stuff. so it's going to be interesting. No it, question. It, it's going to be really interesting. Because we have a lot to lean on. I mean, Benitez has given us some wonderful stuff. There's been some stuff in some other states. You can, I mean, their playbook, you can pretty much go to Bianchi or the California stuff or any of the other stuff, and you can read the playbook while well, magazines aren't arms or this isn't covered or what. You can just look at all that stuff and read their playbook. They're such an open book. So now we will uh, we will tackle that, and I think we'll uh, you know it, it's it's going to be interesting to say the least. But I think we'll prevail um, with the trial judge. I think it's going to look you know I mean I would wager to say that Judge McGlynn is a smart fellow, and he has probably read what Judge Benitez has written. He's probably written what a few other places have written, um, and so. You know, we'll see what our filings are going to be like, and then obviously we'll find out if we're going to have a trial. Todd Vandermeid, Freedom Steel on YouTube, uh, longtime gun rights advocate. Greatly appreciate you taking the time with us, and uh, we'll definitely connect again in the near future. And thanks for jumping on with uh, virtually no uh, <laughs> with no uh, planning. Uh, I just I appreciate you chiming in and uh, wanting me to call you. So uh, good to do that live this morning. Nah, kind of psyched. I can't wait for 9 o'clock to get here. <laughs> You've already got your popcorn out, I bet. All right, man, best to you yep. and your family. Uh, we'll talk soon, all right? See ya. All right, so Todd Vandermeid there, Freedom Steel. Uh, appreciate him being willing to just jump in live. Uh, by phone to, to tackle that. Uh, so clearly today's a big day, not just in the U.S. Supreme Court, but even in the Southern District of Illinois court when it comes to guns uh, and laws that are passed. But uh, you've also got other courts, uh, FPC, Firearms Policy Coalition, uh, just to touch on this before we wrap this segment up, because this is a long segment, but I think an important one for this morning. Uh, FPC legal reminder, our, quote, assault weapon ban lawsuits have kept the lawsuit printer busy lately, and now... Uh, that two are pending SCOTUS cert decision uh, and several others are seeking action soon. Uh, they say that the tears of anti-right zealots uh, can be heard in the not so far off distance. So they list all of these different cases that they have, including the uh, Harold V. Raul pending SCOTUS cert petition in Illinois uh, and a variety of other cases that they've got, including uh, the uh, decision uh, in the uh, ban in Cook County uh, with uh, Viramontes. I think that's how you pronounce that. So clearly uh, a lot more action in the courts. Uh, but it's not just in the courts. You've also got in the legislature across the country in Georgia uh, bearing arms reports that uh, they're looking at uh, a measure that would uh, penalize parents for minors gun activity. So if a kid, you know, gets a firearm and does something uh, inappropriate, uh, then the parents could possibly be held liable. But over in Hawaii, uh, they've got uh, a measure that uh, passed committee which was about gun control, but gun rights activists say that actually it's not as bad as it could have been. Uh, Hawaii Firearms Coalition says uh, while it's still very much anti-gun, some significant changes to the bill were made for Senate Bill 3196 in Hawaii. The ban on assault rifles and shotguns was removed. What was left in place was a ban on 50 cal firearms, a ban on magazines holding more than 20 rounds, the bill previously had it at 10, and a ban on assault pistols 
with one feature, law currently says two, uh, the bill now moves over to the House. So what's interesting there is you've got uh, the question of you know magazine capacities, right? And in Illinois, uh, a different capacity limit. Uh, so not really much uniformity. So it kind of makes it sound like some of these uh, magazine limits are arbitrary, which if things are arbitrary, they're hard to stand up in court. So interesting to see that. So that's just the latest here with Bishop on air uh, on this Wednesday morning as we uh, get ready to see what happens in the U.S. Supreme Court and also in the Southern District of Illinois. So I appreciate you guys being here and it uh, looks like the live stream went through great. So give me that thumbs up or uh, you know an awesome or an exclamation point. Uh, if you've been able to watch this without any interruptions, so thumbs up on that for the live stream. All right, uh, of course, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and follow me anywhere. Just search Bishop on Air. All right, Bishop on Air. It's that simple. So let's make it happen. All right.